So welcome to another episode of Men Able Matters with me, Steve Witten. As we work our way through Mental Health Awareness Week in May 2023, I'm absolutely delighted to be presenting Men Able Matters in association with Jardine Motors Group. Now, they very kindly put forward a number of people to take part in this podcast, and I'm equally delighted to welcome today to our episode, Richard Ennefer. Richard, how are you, sir? Uh, yeah, very good. Thank you. Uh, stay very good. Uh, busy, but that's always good. <laughs> busy. That's like the middle name of anyone who works in the automotive industry, isn't it? Yeah, rolls off the tongue quite easily, I think, it, for it, most people. But yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's good busy, definitely. Yeah, excellent. Good. All right, that's good. So, Richard, in a great men able manners fashion, could I get you to give us a little bit of an intro as to who you are, where you're from and what you do? And uh, if you want to make that last about half an hour, that'd be brilliant. And uh, I'm absolutely fascinated by your backstory and uh, the comparisons around stress and anxiety and maybe even depression and all of that stuff um, that we can talk about as obviously this week's theme is is anxiety. So over to you. Uh, yeah, so I'm Richard Ennefer. I'm a general manager at Jardine Motors Group. I've mm -hmm. worked for the group for 16 years this year, um, been in the motor trade for 20 years. Um, as you've alluded to, got quite an interesting background as to how I came into the motor trade. Um, I live in Essex uh, on the coast with two young children and two mad sausage dogs. Um, <laughs> very keen cyclist. Um, but yeah, it'd be really interesting to sort of uh, chat a bit more particularly about, as I say, how I came into the motor trade and some of the challenges that um, I've probably seen over what feels like a relatively short period of time. But likewise, actually coming up for 20 years in the trade. So. Wow. OK. Well, I mean, we talked about just before we started recording, we talked about uh, your journey into the industry. And I think like most people, you probably fell into it, stumbled into it, turned up by accident, you know, whatever. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you did before, because you dropped into conversation that there was a few mm. things that you've done in the past. And I, I think it immediately made me think, wow, every single one of those things carries with it stress and anxiety, but it's all very, very different. So. Yes. Uh, give us a little potted history, Richard. Yeah, so I um, I left school and decided to train as a chef. Um, I I was always intent that I didn't want to sort of wear a suit and sat behind sit behind a desk, which is ironic, really, as that's what I <laughs> tend to do for a lot of the time now. Um, but I, I I always wanted to do something sort of quite practical um, and. Uh, you know with my hands and creative and things like that so yeah I, I, I became a chef I did it for um, I think it was three and a half years um, at Colchester Institute um, and then got a work placement abroad which was all part of um, wow. what you got so I, I moved abroad lived over there at the age of 18 years old um, whereabouts uh, so in Switzerland so Zurich oh nice um, I worked there in a, an amazing restaurant um, I was a pastry chef and and very good money. Switzerland was, you know, quite, they're quite lucrative. And um, as you can imagine, they, they pay quite well. So at 18 years old, I thought, you know, this is it, this is me sort of sorted. And, <laughs> um, you know, it was a, it was a very full on role um, with crazy hours. Um, but... And is it, am I right in saying there's a bit of a hierarchy in, in, in a kitchen i mean you say you got to pay yeah. i would no idea where that sits in the hierarchy but i've just got images of yeah you know, the top chef being the one who sort of bangs everything and shouts at everyone and... yes is that yeah. about right my I, my head chef was french um and very passionate yeah um is a is a polite way of putting it um, i learned a lot of french words that i didn't know before all that <laughs> um but but he was you know i think as a leader he was somebody that naturally you sort of looked at and you knew that he was the head chef um right, he had a okay. presence about him and you know a certain manner as well um but yeah i think it, it, you're right in the hierarchy you've got sort of commie chefs and people who sort of you know peel the potatoes and all that type of thing and then you go up from that so mm -hmm. i was head pastry chef at 18 years old which was quite a, a lot of responsibility a 300 cover restaurant so on a busy lunchtime 300 covers which was you know you in my role i was responsible effectively for anything to do with the pastry side so any of the sweet dessert things um so yeah it was it was a full-on role and at 18 years old it was quite it was quite something let's put it that way um, yeah yeah, yeah and what did that teach you about stress and ang um, you know, anxiety and stuff do you think 
Well, I, I think I think the big thing for me was I, I I saw a lot of people handle the stress and anxiety, but in the wrong way. Um, I saw a lot of people, whether it was things like substance abuse, things like that. Oh right, um, okay. which is you know it seemed to be quite quite rife, um, mm-hmm. you know, and it was a way for a lot of people to you know get through the day because my my working day started at five a.m. I worked through till about one two p.m. I'd have three hours off and then I'd go back into work for the evening and you'd work through till midnight and then you go out. So it, oh, wow. it was, right. okay. it was a, yeah. And you had, I think it was a nine day on four day off shift. So, you know, if you come off the back of nine days of that, that is full on. And I think I saw a lot of people who dealt with that the wrong way. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and also I saw a lot of people who dealt with it the right way. And, you know, I've worked with people that, use sort of exercise as their release of having to get over a day like that and a service like that and also I saw a lot of people who didn't then latch on a night out onto that full-on working day so yeah yeah it, it was interesting to watch people and again there was a bit of a generational thing of that but you know my my head chef was despite being very very passionate when he was at work he was incredibly calm outside of it um uh, and he was able to sort of measure those quite well, um, you know, on the surface, certainly. Um, but yeah, it was a real eye opener, I think, particularly at that age, at 18, sort of seeing how people dealt with the stress and the strain. Because it was, it was, it was full on. I think, you know, my role now is quite full on, but it's not working in a 50 degree heat kitchen where it is physically really demanding and, you yeah, know, you feel yeah. dizzy constantly because it's so hot or so cold in the opposite way if you're working in you know bridges and things like that so Mm. yeah it was it was a real pressure job but very different pressure yeah and and that's why I was asking really and and obviously we'll come on to your the next bit of your history which is you know gets even more fascinating yeah um because you know it's all relative isn't it you know it's all about the situation that you're in and how you're handling it what the people around you are doing and how how they're dealing with stuff so Mm. from being a chef um you you then went on to do something that actually i look back at and think i wish i'd done that as well but i'm not sure i would have had the uh, capacity so yeah tell me a bit more about that yeah so i i um strangely when i when i sort of moved back to the uk i realized that being a chef was very poorly paid Mm -hmm. um even if you work in london um uh, very very poorly paid so i had the bright idea to join the police um not quite sure why um on a bit of a whim um and joined the police um in essex um and worked through my probation period and then worked uh, a little way after that um and then had a had a pretty serious car accident, which is what ended my career in the police effectively. So um, 2003 now, so cracky 20 years ago, didn't realize Mm -hmm. it was that long actually. Um, But uh, the one thing I would say about the police and I I don't say it, you know, very often, but I I hated the time in the police. I I really, I I really struggled with it. Um, I went through some really tough, dark times in the police. with various things um and it it was an interesting time because i look back at it now and think well i don't regret doing it because I, i'm not that type of person but likewise i also absolutely um am very grateful that i did get out of it and much how i never want to have a car accident which is what resulted in me leaving actually it was probably the best thing that could have happened to me yeah um, yeah it was it was a tough time you know i, I split up with my now wife um, we've been together for, um, crikey, I must get this right, uh, 21 years. Um, but we split up during that time when I was in the police because I was not the same person um, at all because I couldn't switch off from work. It was, yeah, it was very, very full on. It does consume you completely. Yeah, that's why I wanted to, to pick up on that because I've got a few mm-hmm. friends who've, um, you know, gone down that route and and it's it's definitely yin and yang you know you you're either of the ability to deal with it or as you say it creates or shapes you into a person that perhaps other people you know and definitely when when i've got the the utmost respect for the police but when you meet a a police officer out of work it's very 
often easy to spot them <laughs> you know what i mean very easy they yeah. have a typical kind of mannerism don't they yeah absolutely and i think you know people used to joke with me about you know the way that i stood and things mm. like that but <laughs> the reality was my actions outside of work were, were the same as when i was in work and mm. that's the problem that then has an adverse effect on in my case you know my relationship and my my wasn't marriage at the time but you know um uh you know our relationship to the point where we we actually split up for a for a short period of time um but that i think that was that was probably the prime example of a of, of a job where i didn't handle the the stress of the job if you will um in the right way um but likewise i could also see people around me that did um, right. handle it right. really well and there's lots of people that i know um who've been in the police you know their entire careers um, whereas I'm actually very glad that I didn't. What makes the difference there then, Richard, do you think, between those that can handle that stress and pressure and those that... Because, I, I mean, I would imagine that even in your rel relatively short time in the police, you must have mm. witnessed or been involved in or seen some stuff that yeah, literally would I, make, you, uh, make you stay awake most of the night. Yeah, and I, I, I think and this was just before I ended up having the, the car accident I had. And again, it's not something I talk about very often, but I, I witnessed two pretty horrific suicides firsthand mm. Mm. within the space of three weeks mm -hmm. um, uh, towards the end of uh, my police career. And I think I, I struggled with that. They, and also I think, yeah, and this is very relevant to what we're discussing, but yeah, exactly. I remember my sort of sergeant at the time sort of palming it off by saying, oh, we do offer counselling, but nobody ever has it. So I didn't. I just went, oh, okay, well, if nobody has it, then, um, you know, nobody has it. Mm -hmm. um, so it was I think it almost would have been frowned upon and seen as a weakness if I'd have actually gone and spoken to somebody about the fact that I was really struggling with you know what I saw and um, you know without going into the details of it it is something that funnily enough up until recently I've never really discussed with anybody um, uh, and then that changed recently after a ironically a mental health sort of workshop that we did through work and I ended up then speaking to somebody about it um, which were, which was quite interesting. So, yeah, I, I think my biggest thing with the police and the, to answer your question around how people deal with it and how people don't, my biggest struggle was with seeing things that were unfair. I'm a very fair person and right. I feel that when something is wrong, I have to address it. But I think the difficulty with the police is you see so much that is wrong where people do you know, fall through the cracks of various things, you know, the systems or whatever it might be. And you do your job to the best of your ability, but it might go the next step to Crown Prosecution Service in our case, and then it gets dropped because of insufficient evidence or whatever it might be. And that I couldn't, I struggled with it because I just had this thing of it just being so unfair that you do the right thing constantly in your life that somebody can do something completely wrong and get away with it. And that's what I struggle with. And I think the people who can deal with that side of it better and just go, well, it is what it is. It's not, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. Whereas I didn't, I would sit there and stew on things and think, why is that right that somebody can get away with that and somebody else can't? Yeah. yeah so that's I, where I struggle with it. I'm with you on that. And I think that's what I meant earlier when I said I, I on reflection, don't think I would have had the capacity to be a police mm. officer as much as I, I kind of like the glamour idea of it at one point and the, the idea of sort of fast track promotions and stuff. But yeah, I think the reality of exactly what you've just described probably would have meant that I'd have, uh, I'd have not been in there very long. I don't think yeah. so I get that. And that's, that's, isn't that interesting that you know, we kind of like look back on it and go, Oh yeah, I can see now why, you know, yeah, things yeah. panned out the and way I, they did. <clears throat> yeah, and I didn't realise it at the time. I think, you know, mm. I, I also didn't realise how how much it was affecting me. Um, you know, and yes, I had, uh, as I say, my, my relationship sort of fall apart because of it. But at the time, I didn't see that. You know, I I didn't see that I was doing anything wrong or the way I was acting outside of work was was wrong as far as I was concerned. I was... But I still have my police hat on, not literally, luckily. So to speak, um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, everywhere we went, you know, if we went for a drink somewhere and I saw somebody do something was wrong, I couldn't help but do something about it. Mm. Um, uh, and I'm much better at sort of not doing that now. Um, I have to sort of, uh, you know, I 
struggle with that inside sometimes where I see somebody, you know, daft stuff, somebody parks in a disabled space and, you know, they haven't got a blue badge, stuff like that really winds me up, <laughs> but not to the point where I'd necessarily say something now. Yeah, you have um, to remember you don't have a warrant card in your back pocket anymore exactly. and, and five um, friends that you can call upon for support. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that that's the big difference. And that's where I struggled, I think, yeah, particularly in the police. But likewise, it's where I now look back and think, well, actually, you know, I can see why it didn't work out for me. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not sort of ashamed of that particularly. And I, again, yeah. I have the utmost respect for, for those that have stuck it out and, mm -hmm. you know, made a career of it because that is a tough role to, to, to carry on, uh, particularly Definitely. in the world we live in now. It's a very different world from what it was 20 years ago. So, yeah. Um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, a lot of respect for them. But, yeah, just absolutely not for me. So from there, uh, was that where yes. you then fell into the automotive industry? Yeah, so I, I sort of, at the time, um, after my car accident, I, I managed to break my arm quite badly and knew that I wouldn't be able to do a physical job anymore. Um, uh, so I sort of didn't really know what to do. I had a couple of sort of odd jobs. I was I was off work for quite a long time. I was uh, off with police uh pay effectively for i think it was six months and then i decided to just make the break and go and you know it was clear i wasn't going to be able to go back so i did a couple of little jobs here and there a couple of catering things that i was able to do and you know just to make ends meet and then somebody a friend of mine who i still keep in contact with now said well you'd be good in sales and the thought of selling like washing machines or tumble dryers or something like that was like horrific <laughs> um so I decided to go old school with a suit with a bunch of CVs and walked around to all the garages, um, including ironically one of the Jardine businesses that I've since worked in as sales manager. Um, but I walked around to all the businesses until I came to um, Glyn Hopkins Group Nissan, and they were the only people that would even give me an interview without any sales experience. Wow. Um, okay. And I went in, you know, had my interview worked my way through Nissan and sort of went from there really and never mm. literally haven't looked back since. So yeah, it's been an interesting journey, certainly. <laughs> so where, where, um, just tell us a little bit about sort of day to day, what your role involves mm. now then. And then I'm really keen to sort of get a bit of an understanding as to how your experience with as a chef and as a police officer, and then, you know, going through the industry, how that's all kind of shaped your ability to deal with, anxiety and stress and and be resilient and obviously yeah. inspire other people to be the same yeah and i think i think resilience the key word there as well really i've uh if i look at what i do now from a day-to-day -day perspective um i run two ineos automotive um dealerships that sell mm -hmm. the ineos grenadier which is a brand new product so you know that is a completely new brand uh to the motor trade um arena and that's really interesting it's a it's sort of a proper gritty four by four and you know, a completely different mark from some of the other marks that I've represented. I've been very lucky over the years with the brands that I've worked with. I've worked with Porsche, uh, Ferrari, Maserati, Bentley, Aston Martin, and now um, Ineos Automotive with Grenadier, and also Pininfarina Batista, which is um, the sliding scale of the opposite of uh, Grenadier. That's a two million pound electric hypercar. Wow. So. Right. My world is quite different. I, mm -hmm. I sort of have to flip from dealing with, you know, commercial customers um, for Grenadier a lot of the time to, you know, multi, multi millionaire, um, you know, high end customers who might look at sort of the pin and farina. So I think if I look at the Ineos side of things initially, which is quite an interesting one, because they're a new brand, there's been lots of challenges along the way, naturally, as we, you know, we start the journey together. And I think the resilience piece for me, I think I've got a lot of energy and that when I look at the chef role, you have to have that. Um, you cannot work in those type of environments without the energy. So you have to have that. So I, I think it takes a lot to knock me down mm. um, and, and sort of knock that energy back. Um, there are times when naturally that does happen, but even mm. so, I think I, I can stay very, very positive um when everything is falling apart around me sometimes and i think hopefully that rubs off on my team and the, the team i have around me now despite lots of challenges we are constantly very positive and we constantly talk and reassure each other that we're doing a good job because sometimes it feels like you're not mm. um 
And, you know, if you have a customer that will tell you that you haven't done a good job, then sometimes it might be because you have, you know, you haven't given them the service that actually you should have given because you're in a scenario where you are facing new challenges and everything's new and you don't know what each day looks like when you come in. But I think the main thing there is just staying resilient, um, you know, because we know that good times will come. We know that things will settle down and, um, you know, we'll understand the new processes and the whole thing will become smoother. And therefore, as we go forward with a brand new brand, it will just get better and better and better. So that to me is the biggest, biggest thing um, that I've taken probably from being a chef. Um, the, the interesting one with the police is that for me, when somebody says something's a disaster at work, I can quite happily sit there and say, that's not a disaster. Um, right. you know, I've yeah. seen some yeah. terrible, terrible things. And actually, if we have something go wrong with a customer's car and they're just about to pick it up or whatever it might be, there's always a solution. And mm -hmm. normally that solution is just about finding, you know, a way through it rather than it actually being a disaster. You know, it's, I think it, it's all a relative thing and trying to get other people to understand that if they haven't gone through those type of things is not necessarily the right thing to do. But I think what I can do is at least assure them that I don't think something is a disaster if something, you know, relatively minor goes wrong. Yeah. So that, that was my reason for asking really was to sort of um, get a bit of a feel from you as to well, what, what actually is in your mind resilience, but also that, as you said, it's all relative because by comparison, you know, some of the things you've dealt with or witnessed are disasters. Mm. Um, but if someone doesn't have any of that as a reference point and they've just spent a lot of money on a car and it's gone wrong, that you can understand that uh, despite how you and I might think, well, that's not really a disaster. It can be fixed for them. It is a disaster. <laughs> Absolutely. So how do yeah, you, I, you know what, you know what I mean? How do you deal with and that? I, and I think for my team as well, mm. if, if I look at from a customer perspective, it's quite different in the sense that to a customer, if a customer says something's a disaster, I will always err on the side of, I understand that's a disaster for them. I think with my team, I think it's more the fact that I want them to understand that if they make a mistake, it's exactly that. It's a mistake. Mm -hmm. We can move past that. And the biggest thing is obviously learning from it naturally. And although it's a bit of a cliche, what I want my team to be able to do is to have the, the confidence that they can come to me when there is a disaster yeah. um, so that they can then talk through it with me. The worst thing that I would have is if, I then have a member of staff who's trying to hide something because they don't feel they can come and talk to me about it. Mm, um, mm -hmm. And I think that's where I try and use that scenario of it's not a disaster. It's just the problem that we need to try and work our way through. And you know, naturally the motor trade throws up all sorts of lovely, weird and wonderful things that, that try and get in our way, but we always overcome the hurdles. I haven't come across anything yet that we literally cannot do yeah it, yeah it's always a way it's just how we go about it so i think it's that's the thing for me is instilling in the team that they can talk to me about whatever it might be and that means also outside of work if somebody's got a problem outside of work i want them to be able to say listen this is what's going on at the moment because then i can try and help you know do whatever we can and there's lots of support that we offer as jardine where i can at least point people in the right direction of that yeah um and I think if you can't have those frank conversations, or at least if your staff feel they can't have those frank conversations with you, then that's you're not really leading the business then to me. Um, yeah. And that's particularly pertinent, isn't it, about the the whole kind of what's going on outside of work because you just yes. you know, you just never know. I mean, you know, you might present to me as a sort of relatively fit healthy guy of and all course. the rest of it but you know it's only after speaking to you for a few minutes that i realize you've got this background and this experience and you know a lot all of that will have shaped you and that's going to yeah. be the same for every single person yeah absolutely and i, I think you know <laughs> i i want to instill in my team as well that you know if they want to take the next step in their career for example mm. These are the type of traits that particularly now are really important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think the, the days are gone of the whole stiff upper lip and leave your problems at the door. Um, uh, you know, I think you, you want to encourage people to be able to 
lead in the same way that you do so that actually they see themselves and go, well, actually, I could take that next step um, in the business. So I think it's a good thing for everybody, not only from a well-being point of view, but I think it's a good thing from a business point of view as well, where you have a team that are honest with each other and feel like they can have those conversations. Yeah, um, yeah. It can only help. So, yeah, it's yeah. a good thing. So uh, just the same as I've asked everyone else who's uh, been on the podcast with me uh, for this series, um, I'm going to ask you in a minute about your top tips then for yes. uh, dealing with this. But before we get on to that, tell me a little bit about Richard outside of work. I know you mentioned cycling. I know you, yep. you've got a family as well. Yeah, so um, I, I have two children. Um, my <laughs> eldest has just turned 16, um, just doing his GCSEs, um, which is a stressful old time. Um <laughs> Although he seems to be taking it much better than I did at the time. Um, he's the calmest person in the world, which is great. So um, that's good. Uh, and then I have an 11 year old who's uh, football mad. I feel like I spend every spare waking moment either playing football, talking about football, watching football. And I'm not a massive football person. So um, that's that's interesting. Um, so, yeah. And then, as I say, I've been married. Um, my wife have been together since we were uh, 18. Um, uh, just turned 40 last year um so yeah that that's um that's been been great she's incredibly supportive um uh you know i think she she sort of understands that the motor trade isn't you know a normal job it sounds weird saying that but the reality is we we sort of understand that but she's very very accommodated into that you know she'll never phone me and say where are you type thing because it's gone six o'clock and everything she's great so um you know from that side of it uh, i'm very very fortunate there um uh, i have a very very small network of friends um mainly based around cycling um right. which uh which is quite interesting so uh yeah and that's my sort of uh thing outside of work really is i cycle a lot i go to wales sort of four or five times a year if i can um mountain biking doing that and then cycle around sort of essex coast quite a bit because it's where i live um so yeah that's sort of me outside of work really right wow okay there's a fair bit fair bit going on then as well so which yes, is what we yeah. you know which is you know probably the case for most people isn't it so so yeah. back to your top tips then mm. uh you know we, we touched on resilience anxiety and you know stress and obviously all that stuff that you've experienced as well what going forward what would be your top tips for anyone who's uh you know maybe dealing with some stuff right now yeah uh, um, is easily triggered as well yeah i think what's interesting and again it's not something i necessarily speak about that much but as i referenced earlier that some of the things i i sort of saw in the police i i recently had some therapy sessions through work which was organized through um one of the one of the programs that we have through here and talking through those situations and actually how best to handle them was really interesting and things around breathing um just silly little stuff around you know taking that time when you have a situation to just breathe properly and you know a bit box breathing that type of thing and mm. that it makes a massive difference um i found that and i've found it i think in situations you know, particularly recently where we have had some challenges with, you know, new brands and things like that, I've been able to take a step back when we have a situation and think about it a bit more rather than reacting straight away, which is what, you know, what I probably would have done a few years ago. Mm. Um, so I think my sort of tip from that is taking a bit of a step back and either looking at it from a customer's perspective or another staff member or whether it's a manufacturer and looking and thinking, well, you know, what's going on in their world at the moment um and actually having those type of conversations you know we i've always had very very good relationships with manufacturers because we've been honest and upfront with them we've not held anything back we've you know we have had some frank conversations naturally at times as we all would do with a manufacturer but i think it's been based off of honesty yeah so i think my biggest tip is just be honest whether that's you know with friends family colleagues whatever it might be if you're honest and upfront with people i think you tend to work through those hard times a lot lot better yeah um, and just just talk about what you're going through um i had that in lockdown i had a horrendous time in lockdown i wasn't furloughed and it was tough it was really tough so i told certain people that it was tough 
and mm -hmm. why. So I spoke about it, whereas, you know, I never would have done that in any of my previous jobs. You know, yeah. as a chef, yeah. you'd never turn around to somebody and say, this is really tough mm. and this is why. You'd never, ever do that, let alone in the police. So I think the times have changed now and it does feel like you're more, you know, I would know who to pick up the phone to if I was really struggling at the moment and going, right, I need to have a chat. Um, and I think that's the good thing. That's the thing I would say to everybody, you know, is be honest and just talk to somebody. Yeah. And what, what has changed then, Richard, between those previous roles and, and what you're doing now? I mean, I, I get the sense there's a, you know, a, an in, a huge and an increasingly growing sense of trust within Jardines in particular. Um, but what, what do you think is different? And, you know, is it, is um, it the pandemic that's, that's made the change or? Yeah, I, I think the pandemic definitely accelerated that. I, I think, you know, we were, we were all checking in. We had like all the senior managers were on a, were on a checking call. And at one point, I think it was nearly every day. Um, and, you know, we all shared our struggles and we all had different challenges. And I was looking after two businesses at the time and literally I was the only person not furloughed. So I was getting every single phone call, every email. So it was very difficult at times to bounce an idea off of somebody because I'm used to being able to just poke my head around the door and speak to my sales manager or my after sales manager. And I didn't have that. So mm. I think what happened is we became a really close group of senior managers and we check in every week. We have a call each week, but I think we all know that we could all go to any one of us and say, I'm struggling with this at the moment. Can you help? Or what would you do? Or what's your best advice? So I think that sort of pushed it to the forefront. I think we talk about it more as well, you know, naturally, the, the the sort of mental health has become much more important now, I mm, think. And it's mm. not necessarily that it's become more important, but I think it's more important that people recognize that it's just as important as your physical health, if not more in some cases. Um, and I think that's always been, you know, if somebody had a broken leg at work, you'd tell them to go to the hospital and get it sorted out. Yeah, yeah. But if somebody was not themselves at work, how often would you actually sort of maybe try and find out why? Yeah, it's a really good point. And it's it's sort of at the heart of, of what we're doing. You know, if, as you rightly say, if somebody had a broken leg, you know, you, you wouldn't hesitate to go up to them. How's the no. leg doing today? You know, but if you knew someone was suffering with PTSD or anxiety or whatever, it, it's, you know, we, we seem to be held back from asking yeah. on a daily basis. How, how are you dealing with that today? Yeah, and I think, I think one thing that, you know, we, we do find pushed and it's pushed from Claire, who's our you know, chief of people now, um, uh, you know, is about if you ask somebody if they're all right, more often than not, people say, oh, you're right. And somebody will say, yeah, fine. Mm. But it's very rarely followed up with a, but how are you really? Mm. And because it's a difficult question to ask, you know, I think it doesn't, doesn't flow naturally that, but I think those type of questions are starting to become a bit more normal now. Yeah, I agree. Um, and that, I think that can only be a good thing really. So yeah, that's that's a real positive that I think has come out of the pandemic. If we're going to pick something positive that came out of it, I think people sort of learn how to communicate better. Yeah. Ironically, yeah. despite not being face to face. So yeah. Yeah, and I think going forward as well, that's that that sort of stuff is becoming, you know, whereas you and I have got experience of this type of conversation being a bit of a buzzword and a fad. Uh for going forward, this is an expectation now, you know, people Absolutely. You know, it, where did, where are you on the looking after my well-being kind of thing? You know, it's a very different world. So, and rightly yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Good. Um, I was going to, I was in the middle of writing down your top tips. So take a step back was one. What yep. was, and communication was another. Yeah. Uh, and the honesty thing, as I say, that's, yeah, that's a big that thing it. for me, but I think taking, taking the time within your working day to, to to take a bit of a step back whether that is and I, I used to do it I went to one of the Cambridge businesses and um my my sort of equivalent on the other side of the business at the Porsche dealership we used to go out for a walk like at lunchtime as often as we could and at one point we were doing it every day and but that was really good just to do that we we have a little circuit around a sort of a field at the back of the dealership um and we would yeah you know, sometimes we'd go out for a really long time but you'd actually get so much done because you discuss different ideas and yeah, you clear know, your head like, and everything. Yeah, absolutely. So I yeah. think that for me is, you know, a bit of, a bit of exercise, a bit of getting up and moving away from your desk and, 
you know, closing your computer for, even if it's 10 minutes, you know, 20 minutes, whatever it might be, I think that's definitely something that would be beneficial to a lot of people. Because yeah. we do have a habit, I think, in the most trade, you know, we joke about a most trade lunch being at three o'clock and you know, <laughs> whatever it might be, if at all. But how many times do we actually stop and go, actually, you've had quite a full on morning. Is it time to just have a little walk around the block or whatever without looking at my phone or emails? I think we, we do fall into that trap naturally. You know, my phone is always on, but there's no harm in taking 10 minutes to walk around the block. And if, you know if it rings then and it's important then fine but if it's not then it can wait till you get back so yeah yeah 100 percent. do you know that's so refreshing to hear you say that because um we've recorded one of these with alison fowler as well and she was talking mm. about how important that is for her and her team um and i put back to her i said well that, you know that's I, I can hear and sense that there'd be salespeople and service advisors that would and technicians would be listening to this going, oh, if only I had time during the day to do that. But to hear that coming from you as a, a head of business and encouraging that around your your people as well is is quite refreshing. So I, I think also if they see that from the senior leaders, they're more mm. likely to think, okay, Follows. it's fine for me to do it as well. Yeah. Um, because it is no good you sort of saying you need to take time for yourself to do that type of thing, and then you do the complete opposite. Mm. because they're not going to replicate that they they'll feel almost guilty for doing it you need to almost you know live and breathe it um and I, i've done it i've done it probably in the last week or so where i've said i'm just going to go out for 10 minutes just to literally you know have a walk about just to sometimes just clear your head a bit and think clearly you need that um you need that time to think a bit more clearly because otherwise mm. you just go gung-ho into the afternoon and away you go and before you know it, it's six o'clock and actually you've not been as productive as you could have been if you'd have just taken a little bit of time to think a bit more clearly so yeah yeah, yeah it's important that yeah 100 percent, brilliant richard you are an absolute star it's been a pleasure having you on men able matters have you enjoyed being a podcast guest absolutely been great thank you <laughs> good stuff well when i'm next down in your neck of the woods i'm going to come and have a look at one of these cars because i do. quickly googled and saw what they are and they look amazing absolutely if you could buy a pin and that would be amazing uh can't guarantee that yeah as i said to paul westaway the other day you know when you're a founder of a social social enterprise you have to be slightly careful how you position that but yeah anything that's ta <clears throat> tax deductible is okay excellent news <laughs> all right <clears throat> good stuff oh dear come all croaky all of a sudden richard thank you very much indeed and uh we'll look forward to catching up with you again soon thank you take care